number four. And we're going to read in your hearing, starting at verse number 19. They gave me a Bible. <laughs> Had to be here at 8 o'clock to know that's an inside joke. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. But Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him and God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth Amen. May God bless the readers and hearers of his word. I want to talk from the subject today, my worship is for real. My worship is for real. We're living in a time now where almost anything goes in the church. We've lost our standards. We've lost our biblical foundation and so it doesn't matter what you do how you do it amen as long as you come people just have compromised the gospel and many of us amen don't really know the real experience of God we're relying on our parents to pray for us. We're relying on our pastor to intercede for us. Other loved ones who are in church, we're relying on their goodness to get us into heaven. But I come to let you know that God is not going to judge you based on your mother's religion. He's not going to judge you based on what your grandparents did. But he's going to judge you on your individual relationship with him. That's like trying to send somebody into school to take the exam for you. <laughs> it's called cheating. And in this text, amen. We're going to be talking about real worship and what real worship is and how we can meet the mark of God. The story in this text is about a nameless Samaritan woman at the well. And don't underestimate when people don't know your name. Just because you don't know my name don't mean I'm not somebody. <laughs> And this woman was nameless, and she was having a conversation with Jesus at the well known as Jacob's Well. It is considered that she was a lonely woman. She was from a race of people that the Jews utterly despised as having no claim to their God. She was considered an outcast and looked down upon by her own people. Sometimes, Pastor, it's not the ones that don't know you. It's the ones that you know that give you the most. <laughs> Fill in the blank. <laughs> Jesus said it this way, a prophet is not worthy in his own home. The ones who know you and seeing how you changed and see your new life, they're the ones that want to uh, judge you on familiarity. I knew you when. That's uh, Melvin. No, that's not Melvin. That's Pastor Maxwell. Amen. 
So it's evidenced by the fact that she came alone to draw water from the community well um, when during biblical times drawing water and chatting with your girls was a social high point of a woman's day. She here is coming by herself uh, signifying that there were some uh, women who did not like her. You know, maybe she stole their man. She, she did have five husbands and was working on number six. Probably a small town and, you know, wasn't too many men to go around. So I'm meddling now, but you know how we do. We... We try to keep our men so close that we think somebody else want him. <laughs> uh, my husband, he jokes and says, you know, I, I'm the best thing happened to you. I said, no, I'm the best thing that happened to you. Because the Bible says a man that findeth. Come on here. I say when the man finds a wife, he finds a good and plenty. And I, I want to speak, I want to talk to some women who tell your business too much. Uh, the reason why the women know what your man want is because you tell it. Child, I ain't going home to cook for him this week. I got stuff to do. Pastor want me in Bible class. I ain't got time to cook no dinner. So that woman who's over there who needs a man, she's saying, she don't like to cook. He got the nerve to want me to rub his feet and rub his bald head and rub his back. She don't want to rub his head, don't want to rub his back, and don't want to rub his bald head. So you gave her what she needed to come in and take your man. So while you at Bible class all night prayer and he's at home hungry with his feet hurting from working all night, she slips in. You know exactly how long you're going to be gone. This woman was so ostracized and mocked as immoral. She was an unmarried woman living openly with the six in a series of men. But in verse number 10 and 11, Jesus offers her a free gift of living water. Women, watch it when he offers you something free. Because it's really not free. I'll take you out to dinner. I'll pay for you to eat. But later on, you can pay me back. You know what that means, right? It's not free. She calls him out because... He, she realizes that he, she's heard these lines before. She done heard this. She got five men she been married to. She done heard them lines. And so have you. You got to come to the place in your life where you understand women, amen, that it doesn't matter what he says. He can whisper those sweet nothings in my ear, but that's not going to change, amen, my posture. If you want this, you got to pay for it. 
If you want this, you got to put a ring on it. Let me see all the single ladies. All the single ladies. Come on. Yeah. Say, put a ring on it. Why should he pay for the milk when he can get it free? I've come to realize that even a, a man will even buy a license for his dog. But he won't buy one for you, for a marriage license. You know, in D.C. it's required to have a license for a dog. But he won't even buy a license for you. He will move into your house, name not on the deed, sleep while you get up and go to work. When you get home, he's asking you, where is the food? Why haven't you cooked? I, I can't get no help in here. Brothers, if you got a tip out, you know where the door is, but this is Women's Day. Does I come to help deliver some women, some desperate women, some low self-esteem women, some women who don't understand you can do good or buy. He gonna drive your car and ask you for gas. He, he's gonna drive your car, drop you off to work, come back and pick you up, come on, and then ask you for gas. Y'all looking at me funny, but I know it happens. And then some of you, so the Bible calls you silly women. I didn't call you silly. The Bible calls you silly women. You got the nerve to put his name on your deed, and you're not even married to him. Then he going to put you out your house. Somebody say the devil is a liar. <laughs> then he's got the nerve to tell you, I'm going to marry you. I just got to get some things straight. <laughs> Trying to get some things straight with this lady. But I, I'm going to marry you. You know I love you. I love you. If he cheat on his first wife, he going to cheat on the second one. Y'all don't want to hear this. Then you're going to date him, never met his family, don't know nothing about him. Then he's going to tell you, I don't want you coming over to my house because I live over in Northeast in the Hood area and it's, it's bad over here. So I'll just meet you down on Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. Let's meet over in the harbor. At the MGM. And you so silly, you meet him over at the MGM at the harbor. Don't know nothing about him. You better hire you an I spy. You better get a private investigator. You, you laughing, but I'm serious. Because there's some things you need to know about somebody before you get into a relationship with them. You need to understand their background. One time my brother, he was dating a girl and amen, found out she had escaped from the insane asylum. I'm telling you what I know, not what I heard. They were looking for her. <laughs> Woo, God, I thank you. You got to ask some hard questions, ladies. Hard questions. 
What's a hard question, co-pastor? Have you had your blood work done recently? I said some hard questions. Do you have a tendency or a liking towards another man? Have you had a relationship with another man? You better ask some... What is your credit rating? How many bills have you not paid? <laughs> I said some hard questions. Child, I, he think I'm meddling when I ask those questions, so I just don't ask him no more. If he can't answer it, then you tell him hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more, no more, no more. She calls Jesus out because she's heard these lines before. She told him, you just like all the mother men I done met. I know that line. But in verse 13, Jesus offers her an opportunity to experience something new. The woman tries to call Jesus' bluff and she says, okay, I'll take that gift, Jesus. Be careful what you accept. Sometimes it's hard to get out what you got into. Ooh, that's a word by itself. I used to work at a shelter for battered women. Amen. And it's hard to get out. I would counsel them and they would go back to him. Say, he's the only one I know. He's, he, uh, he takes real good care of me and I bought it on myself because he wanted fried chicken. I cooked baked chicken. He said he'd kill me. He'd kill my family if I didn't stay with him. This is real talk. And so they go back and you just, there's nothing you can do. And next thing you know, you hear that they, they got killed. I worked with a woman once and she, amen, she had this ex-boyfriend. She was married. She had an ex-boyfriend and he, he, uh, he, he, he didn't want to let her go. If I can't have you, you know that line. He hired his drug addict brother who was sleeping up under the bridge in D.C. Hired her, hired him, gave him a few dollars to get his drugs on. He came to her house over in Maryland, amen, knocked on the door. Her little daughter, about seven years old, for some reason opened up the door. He had a sawed-off shotgun. When she walked down the door, down the steps, he shot her. She ran out the door to the neighbor, and he shot her in the back. This stuff is real. Don't accept the gift. If you're not willing to take on what comes with it, you've got to have self-esteem where you understand that you are somebody. You've got to look in the mirror every day with curves, with bulges. Come on here with wrinkles. Come on here with bald spots. I don't care what your issue is. You look in the mirror every day and you tell yourself, I got it going on. He don't want you don't mean God don't want you. Verse 16, Jesus reveals to her something that makes her know that he is not like her other male lovers. He's not like her so-called friends or her wishy-washy family. He allows her to take that look in the mirror at herself. Michael Jackson said it this way, I'm looking at the what? And I'm asking him to change his ways. There's a woman looking in that mirror too. And I'm asking her to change her ways. 
Your sleeping with him is not going to get him to marry you. This is the beginning of her real worship experience. And so I submit to you today that real worship without a revealing of yourself through the eyes of God does not exist. You must first perceive who God is and what you are in relationship to God in order to really understand real worship. I'm nothing without you, God. I'm like a ship without a sail. I'm, oh my God. <laughs> I can't do nothing without you. I'm, I'm literally uh, absent without your presence. In verse 19, she says, I perceive that you are a prophet. She comes to understand that he who is revealing things to her, who did not know these things about her, amen, is only able to do it if he is a man of God. He's not just like one of those other men she's had, amen. He's like, not like, amen, those husbands she's had that she had to give up, amen, that didn't work out. But he is a son of God. And the Bible calls it, says it this way, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he'll make it good. If he spoke it, somebody say he'll bring it to pass. We read that scripture too fast. We got to stop right after God is not a man. Because God is not like other men. He cannot measure up to other men. You can't measure up to him. Amen. The Bible says in the Old Testament that, amen, they put uh, the God into, uh, God was in the temple and they put a Dagon God in there beside God. Amen. And the Dagon God, when they went back, had fell over. It was a statue and it fell over. And the scripture says, beside me, there is no other. We quote that scripture, but we really don't know what it means. When you look at the text, he's saying, nobody can measure up to me. Nobody is on my level. Oh, let's just go check the record and see the last time somebody tried to measure up to God. His name was Satan. He was in heaven. He had everything going for him, and, but he got big headed. He thought he was like God. He said, I will be like the most high. I will ascend my throne above God. Next thing you heard about him, he was kicked out. Somebody say, kick him to the curb. He was kicked out of heaven. Amen. And then when you read further in your Bible, I'm giving you permission to get to the end of the book. You know, when you're reading a good novel, you try not to find out the end. Amen. You're just wondering what's happening. But I'm giving you permission at the end of the book to take a quick look. When you go to the end of the book called Revelation, that same Satan is lifting up his eyes in hell. Come on, he's going to Hades, the bottomless pit. And a good movie, the star never dies. And at the end of the book, it says, come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> God is in a place now where he's trying to teach you not to depend on other people, but God is taking you to a level where, he underst where you understand that it's God that is doing everything for you. It's God. It's in him I live. It's in him I move. It's in him I have my being. I want to talk to you about things that worship is not. Worship is not defined by who. You should not be defining how you worship by who does it in front of you, how they've done it before you. Just because it's traditional to do it a certain way doesn't mean that God is still moving in that way. 
The God that we serve changes up. He's not uh, predicating things on how your mama did it and how your great-grandma did it. The Bible says that she said, our fathers. She's trying to get Jesus to see that you can't come with this new religion. You can't come with this new doctrine. We're used to doing things a certain way. I stopped by to tell East Friendship, just because you've done it that way, don't make it the right way. Just because you've done it, always done it that way, doesn't mean there's a different, not a different way. There's not a new way to do it. You keep using that flip phone. And see. See, see, see what folk going to say about you. If I walked in your house and saw a phone and you doing like this, two. Nine. Look at the young people looking at me. Don't even know what I'm talking about. Six. Shrunk. Seven. You wonder what in the world is wrong with me. If I stop by your house tonight and you got a TV with a, um, a hanger, stuck in the antenna part and you're shaking it and moving it trying to get the static out out the picture you look at me crazy if i came by your house and you had a pair of pliers and you oh shoot i was trying to get to channel 20 when Man, I missed it again. Shoot, shoot, shoot. You wonder what is wrong with her? What planet is she from? And that's how it looks to God when you get caught up in the old ways of doing things. That's not how we done it. I've been at this church for 75 years. And pastor, I appreciate your new vision. I appreciate that God is talking to you. But I had a talk with God last night. He told me the way we've been doing it is just fine. But God wants you to experience something new. He wants you to have a new relationship with him, not based on our fathers. The only our father you should be doing is the Lord's prayer. Our father, which art in heaven, <laughs> hallowed be thy name. Just because others can live any kind of way and still appear to have a worship experience doesn't make it a real worship experience. The musicians still got to live right. I don't care how anointed you are, how gifted you are. Choir members, we still got to wear our white, but we got to live a pure life. To match what we sing. Amen. Amen. Preachers. You got to live what you preach about. And if you ain't ready to live it. Then don't preach it. This message for the pulpit to the door. Ushers. You can't usher us in with a nasty attitude. Sit yourself down right here on the third row. Pastor told me to make sure all the roads are filled up front. <laughs> there is a level of holiness expected. You don't have to have holiness in your church title name. 
You don't have to have a clergy collar on. The same requirements apply no matter who you are. Last time I read my Bible, it says only the pure in heart shall see God. And holiness, our God is a holy God. And he expects holiness, child. You know, you just got to um, do some things to get them here. <laughs> Pastor, you just, you got to find ways to get them in the church and whatever it takes. <laughs> worship is not defined by how. This woman in verse 20 says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. They came in this way. This is the way it's supposed to be done. It's not based on your emotional feeling. Let me talk to those who are new to church. It doesn't take a whole lot to experience God. You just have to open up your heart just like you do to your boyfriend and girlfriend. You open up your heart. And you allow yourself to get to know them better. That's the same way it is with God. But on the other hand, don't judge us who choose, amen, to have an emotional experience. I guarantee if I follow you to the club on Friday night, you having an emotional experience. Get down, get down. I mean, I'm sorry, that's not the newest. Tell you how long I've been at the club. Been a long time. I just don't understand why they're so emotional in church. It doesn't take all of that, all that jumping and shouting and sweating. Isn't that what you do at the club? Uh, moving, sweating, jumping. Um... We still like the party over here. We just changed partners. Ain't no party like the Holy Ghost party, because the Holy Ghost party don't stop. We believe in expressing ourselves. We come from Africa. <laughs> But on a serious note, when we feel God, we feel good. Somebody said, well, I don't feel God that way. Then express the way you express. He doesn't touch me in that manner. Well, do it the way you do it. But let God know that you, amen, reverence him. The Bible says, that she came to God trying to get a new experience. We shouldn't have to do spiritual acrobats to get you to open up your mouth. When I look at Psalm 150, it says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. It didn't say let all the saints. It didn't say let the preachers, come on, it didn't say just let the worship team and the choir. It said anybody who has breath, who God woke up this morning, kept you, amen, in your right mind, just tell God, thank you. Mama would be real mad if somebody gave you a gift and you didn't tell them thank you, would she? <laughs> amen. So this woman is learning to worship God out of a relationship with him. We don't worship him because of just what he's done, but we worship him for who he is. He is high and lifted up. He's the almighty God. Songwriter said, I don't know why Jesus loves me. I don't even know why he cares about me. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad. So glad he did. Where would I be? 
It wasn't your good driving that called, didn't make you not have an accident. Where would I be? You did the same things other people did, and they ended up with AIDS. Where, where would I be? You smoked the same drug somebody else smoked, and they had an overdose. Where? Where would I be? You didn't even get a college education, but you make more money than the person who just got their doctorate degree. Where would I be if he didn't love me? Even if you don't feel emotions, you should open up your mouth and tell God how much he means to you. Let's practice that. Open up your mouth. Tell him thank you. Yes, he's the air I breathe. He's the way made out of no way. He's the sanity in my thoughts. Come on, he's the uh, beat of my heart. He gives me the activities of my limbs. I worship him for who he is. Hallelujah. He kept me in my right mind, gave me the activities of my limbs. Oh, God kept my children from going to, into the uh, prisons. Last time I went to the doctor's report, he made all the blood work normal. He did that. And even when it came back abnormal, he healed me. <laughs> Anybody got healing? Anybody had a miracle work and the doctor shook their head, said you will only be here two more years and you done outlived the doctor? That's why we worship him for who he is. Finally, worship is not defined by the where. Doesn't matter where you come to worship. If this church is not good for you, find another one. You don't like First Baptist, go to Second Baptist. Don't like Second Baptist, go to Third Baptist. But find somewhere to go. Don't die without a pastor. And then we got to figure out who's going to do your eulogy. She ain't never been on my roll. She ain't, she ain't been here. I don't know who that is. And stop joining the church and don't come back no more. That you don't go to the work on their first day and don't come back the second day. <laughs> it's not based on the where. You can come in the hood, East Friendship. You can come in the hood to East. <laughs> <laughs> Go, East Friendship. If you sadiddy, you can go to the suburbs. <laughs> Afraid they're going to break in your car or something. You know, you can go to the suburbs. You know, my husband and I, we moved way out in Rockville one time. I'm just going to park here in the meter, as my husband say. Put a quarter in it. We moved way out in Rockville trying because we grew up in the hood. Way out in Rockville thinking we were getting away. And one night they said they're going to um, park, uh, do the lines on the parking lot and move your car by 6 a.m. I told my husband, I set the alarm clock. I said, hon, you got to get up and move that car before 6. He's sleeping at 6.30. We go out there, the car is gone. Somebody say gone. gone. I called up front office. I said, y'all done took my car. You better bring my car back around here. It was only 30 minutes. They said, we, ain't, we didn't um, call the people yet. <laughs> we ain't called them. They haven't come yet. That don't start till 8. We just told you 6.
We called, we called around. Our car was gone. We didn't see it again until 30, day, 30 days later. You know, the good thing, God works in mysterious ways. I didn't like that car. <laughs> Toyota Camry, I'll never buy it again. I'm sorry, you got one? Toyota Camry, I kept telling those people something wrong with my car. I took it in there three or four times. It's okay. I said, no, when I press the accelerator and go up the hill, it makes this knocking noise. No, it's good. Stole our car next time we saw it was over in the hood. <laughs> Northeast Washington. What was that school? <laughs> over by Spingarn, back in... <laughs> Back in the back of the school on a lot, burned to, burned down to the frame. The only way we knew it, I, it was our car because of the license plate. I said so much for moving to the suburbs. <laughs> oh, I got to get back to my message. It doesn't matter where you come, as long as you go to church. It is a necessity. I'm a member of live streaming Baptist Church. <laughs> Has to thank you, but I joined live streaming Baptist Church. We only have to wear our pajamas. That church is not ministering to you. Thank God for all the people who got media opportunities. The Bible says that Jesus will not return until all have heard the gospel. So it has a purpose. It's for the sinners. Amen. We're flipping that TV with the pliers. Amen. And getting to that station. But for those of you who belong to East Friendship Baptist Church, you are expected to be in the house of worship to hear a word from your pastor. Come on here. And, and to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together with your brothers and sisters. No wonder you don't know each other because you're not fellowshipping. Small group, there's a plug. So worship is not defined by where you're located. It's not predicated on how big your church is, how small it is, whether it's 10 members or 10,000. If that's where God has assigned you for this season, then you are to be there and get what God has for you. Whether you decide to be in the choir log or the pews, whether you decide to be in the pulpit or at the door, amen, being in the house, David said it this way, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. There's a certain covering that God puts over your life even when you're not living all you should because you come and get prayer from your leaders. It's called favor. Somehow worship is reduced to a tourist mindset. I'm visiting an attraction this Sunday. I'll come at my adequate leisure. It's a weekly check the box. An occasional visit for a special service. It's what we call CME, CME Christians. They come on Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. Jesus makes a bold statement to this woman. He says, an hour is coming, and it's already here, when those who will worship me, neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, but they will worship me in spirit and in truth. I submit to you today that God is looking for some real worshipers. Those who will worship when and whenever, wherever, 
Amen. Jesus was teaching this woman that her worship is not based on how emotional she gets, but how grateful she is. I want to read the message Bible to you of verses 21 through 24. I think it exudes, amen, a good revelation of this. He says, believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the father, neither here at this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of the day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming, and it has in fact come, when what you're called will not matter. And where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that will count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit into a pursuit of truth. If you don't feel an, a, a longing to understand truth and to get to know God better, you're not in real worship. He says that's the kind of people the Father is looking for. Those who are simply honest with themselves before him in worship. You don't come before God thinking you got it all together. He already knows we don't have it together. So we come and confess our faults before him and we ask him to help us to be better people. He says those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves with adoration. So the definition of worship in the Greek is pronoskio, meaning to kiss or to reverence or to adore. It's noted 59 times in the New Testament. It originally carried with it the idea of someone falling down to kiss the ground before a king or to kiss his feet. And so in the English, it literally means to ascribe worth to something. You can't honestly worship God if you don't reverence him. If you think God is just another uh, religion like Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad, then you really can't worship God. You've got to see God high and lifted up. King Uzziah said in the year, uh, Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Something had to die in his life. Something had to be killed in his life. Some tragedy had to happen in his life for him to see God. You don't want to wait till a tragedy happened for you to really see who God is. He will show up in your tragedy. But isn't it better if he show up on a sunny day? Isn't it better for you to love him? Come on, when things are going well? Isn't it better for you to know him in the power of his resurrection as well as in the power of his suffering? The only way to really reverence God and know who he is is that you got to know who you are. I'm nothing without you, God. I can't do nothing without you. I'm like a ship without a sail. Hallelujah. I'm a bad person on a bad day. Come on here. I don't care what titles I have in front of my name, how many DDs, and uh, come on here. I have degrees behind my name. You can have more degrees than a thermometer. But if you ain't intelligent to know, enough to know that God is our creator. And in the beginning, I said in the beginning, God, he was there in the beginning. He was there in the beginning of your life. Hallelujah. He said in the beginning, God, God created the heavens and the earth. He created something out of nothing. You find me a God that you know that can make something out of nothing. He took Adam and made him a wife out of dirt. Come on, out of the rib. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Out of her, his rib. And he put flesh on it. And he called her woman. Why did he call her woman? Adam said, wow, man. 
Look what God has given me. He took woman out of his side for her to walk beside him. Not out of his back. Amen. For her to be behind him. Not from under his foot for him to step on him. Not on top of his head for her to usurp authority over him. But he took the woman out of his rear and put uh, flesh around it. And said this is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And the two of you shall become one. You got to ascribe some worth to God by first understanding who you are. You are nothing. Amen. When we die, we go back to the dust of the earth. There's no bodies in, in the grave. There's no flesh. You can put all the jewelry in there, you know. For, you better get that to somebody. In fact, use it while you're living. Go pawn it in or something. Get some money for it. There's nothing in the grave but bones. But our spirit lives forever. Well, thank you, Holy Ghost. Our spirit lives forever. He said he's going away to prepare a place for us. And that where he is there, we will be also. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I'm not going to lie to you. He says, but I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man can come to the Father except it come through me. You can try Buddha if you want. Go check Buddha's grave. You'll see the bone still there. Go check Confucius' grave. You'll see the bone still there. But if you go to Jesus' grave, you'll find that he's not there. For he's risen from the grave. He said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men under me. Black men, white men, Jews and Gentiles, all created and color, young men, young men, old men. He said, I'll draw them unto me. Because the Father is looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. I stop by to tell you that God wants a people that will obey. God is looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. He's looking for his bride. He's coming back like a thief in the night. If I knew when he was coming, I'd give you the exact date. I'd give you the exact I give you the minute and the second so you can get yourself ready. But I don't know when he will return. But one thing I know, one thing I know, he's coming back. He's coming back. He said judgment will begin at the house of God. God said I'm starting with the church first. One thing I know, Psalmist said, one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind me. I know you like your past. I know it was good to you. He said, and I reach forth to those things which are ahead. I press, I press, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to see him look upon his face. They to sing forever of this saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cause I pass home at last ever to rejoice. I can't stay here. I can't stay here. My mind is made up. I'm on my way up. Going to see the king. I worship him to the 
build up a relationship with him. And if I have a relationship with him, he'll take me in his home. Oh, God. I don't plan to go to hell, heaven, go to hell by way of the church. If you ain't going to live right, just go ahead out there. Do everything you're going to do. Get it on out your system. Store your royal oats. Come on here and come when you're ready. Hopefully, Jesus doesn't come before you decide you're ready. Spirit revealed to me that God is not going to judge you when he comes back on your past works. But you will be judged on your present state. He doesn't care how many fish dinners you fried and sold at the church. How many Katie did you sold. How many Krispy Kreme donuts you sold for fundraisers. He wants to know, are you ready when he cracks the sky? And he's not concerned about how many mistakes you make. That's why we have the avenue of repentance. Shouldn't be a lifestyle of sin. But we all sin and come short of the glory of God. And you should not be afraid to come to the altar and ask God to forgive you. Because people have no heaven or hell to put you in. Child, she up there again? Yes. And if you knew best, you'd be up here with me. Because I saw what you did last night because you and I were at the club together. God wants real worshipers. Those who worship him out of their spirit in a pursuit towards truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. God says, if you delight in him, he'll give you the desires of your heart. And a lot of people think that means God is going to give you whatever is in your heart that you want. But God says, no, when you delight in me, I place desires in you. My desires I place in you. And because they are my desires... And your desire becomes my desire. My desire becomes your desire. I can't do nothing but give it to you. Why would he not want to give you what is on his mind to give you? But your desire must become his desire. And then he births it. And all of a sudden you say, oh, I just want to learn more about God. That's God placing a desire in you, his desire in you. I think I'm going to go to Bible class tomorrow night. That's God placing his desire in you. Don't rebuke the devil, Satan, you're a liar. That's my girl's night. No, flow with it and let God do it. I want to open up the altar today for someone who has a desire to get to know God better. Whatever has been a hindrance to you, God says, I'm about to remove it. Hallelujah. I'm about to remove, remove every hindrance that has been affecting your ability to get to know me better. Don't wait for nobody else. Just come. If your desire is to become God's desire, you want God to do something greater in your life. Come on to the altar. The altar, yes, Lord. The Father, thank you, Father. You say, Preacher, I just want prayer. For Pray for me. 
was just pray for me i'm going through some things right now and the enemy is really busy come on let me pray let me pray with you hallelujah thank you father that's right come oh what a savior is you know coming to the altar is like not coming to the altar is like having a sickness in your body and you not go to the emergency room why are we so afraid of the altar it's where the you come and get help somebody prayed for me somebody had me on their mind took the time to pray for me i'm so glad they prayed hallelujah i want to pray a special covering over the women all the women can you come all women yes lord thank you father yes brothers after the women get to the altar i want you to look around behind you <laughs> the church needs the women and we need the women strong we need them healthy amen we need the women moving in their gifts and their talents and their abilities we need ministries birth through the women look at your sister and say i need you you need me we're all a part of god's body You can't worship God and be mad at your sister. It just doesn't go together. If there's something hindering you and your sister, you go to her and get it straight. And the Bible says if she don't receive you, you go get your pastor. And say, Pastor, can you meet with me and Sister Blue? Because I tried to get it straight, but she wouldn't accept it. And then the Bible says, if the pastor can't resolve it, you shake the dust from your feet. Somebody say, that sounds like God to me, doesn't it? And God has gifts and callings and abilities in this place. There's anointings that God, oh God, I thank you. There's things you've been through. That when you think about it, it brings tears to your eyes. But God said, think about the young ladies who are going through that. And they need your testimony. They need to know your experience. Everybody's not going to have a pulpit ministry. Everybody's not going to have a ministry within the church. But there's so much to do outside the church. Shelters, women abuse centers. Come on here school systems for our young girls to help encourage them teach them teach them take the facade off and share mothers share what you've been through because our young people they spoiled yes they are excuse me dear they're spoiled they don't know what it's like what we've been through in college sitting with a typewriter brother's typewriter and every time i make a mistake i gotta pull the paper out tear it up and start all over again having 12 books on the table from the library the encyclopedias flipping through and putting the piece of paste paper in this so i can go back to there now they just google and research it cut and paste it into the document Anybody remember the white out? Yeah. He's probably out of business, isn't he? Yeah. We got to share those testimonies. We got to share those experiences. And most of all, we got to show love to these young people. I love seeing you all here. Don't make this your last time coming. 
my dear right there, God has something special for you. You have such a sweet heart, an open heart, and sometimes you, you're too nice to people. They take advantage of you. But God has great things for you. You're going to be somebody. Hey, God. Hey, God. They're going to be reading about you, let me tell you. God, I thank you for the anointing that's on her life. You are a giver. You give. You don't mind sharing. And people like that, God wants to bless them. I said, Lord, if you give me more money, I'm just going to pay more tithes. And guess what he did? He gave me more money. And guess what I did? I upped my tithes. That's how he blesses. I remember one time he pushed, put on my heart to give a thousand dollars. I said, Satan, you a liar. <laughs> In the blood of Jesus. He said, if you give me a thousand dollars, I will count it as a tithe. And guess what? He blessed me with ten thousand dollars. Because one thousand is what? 10% of 10,000. You got to trust God. Lift your hands. I got to close. I feel an anointing resting upon these women. Pastor, you got a great group of women here. Eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. Neither has it entered the hearts of men. The great things he has in store for you. I bind all confusion. I come against controversy in the name of Jesus. I speak love and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Whatever's weighing you down, God said, I'm lifting it, daughter. That struggle is over. Begin to praise God. He's lifting it. He says, I'm wiping the tears from your eyes. What the devil meant for evil, God said, I'm about to bring some good out of it. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I dare you praise him for what he's about to do. I dare you praise him for what he's working on. I dare you praise him for what's on the way. Let the naked eye can't see. Yeah, oh God. He says, I'm about to reveal it. I'm about to reveal it. I'm about to reveal it. Hallelujah! Somebody holler the struggle. Don't let no man tell you otherwise. You are somebody. You hear me? You can make it all by yourself if you have to on broken pieces. But you can still make it. Hey, God. You can make it on broken pieces. The Bible says some went on boards. Some went on broken pieces. But guess what? They all made it safe to land. And I need you to touch your sister beside you and say, we all going to land together. We going together. If you can't make it, I'm going to stay back and help you. You are my sister. You are my sister. And I love you. Now hug somebody as you go to your seat. Hug somebody. Not the ones that you like.